Okay, I think I think this is happening. Slowly. Can I just check? Are you are you seeing the big black? No, Dora, no. you need to make it as the presentation. Yeah, no, I will, the, I will. I yeah. will. <laughs> Do you want to try it? Yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine now. No, yeah. no, no big black line, black bar. Uh, no, it's it's fine. No, okay. no, not like we had before. No. Good, good. Okay. Perfect. I wonder how you do that, actually. <laughs> Right. Uh, morning, everybody. We'll uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes before uh, we get to ten o'clock, and then we'll aim to start just just at ten o'clock. And in the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat uh, function, your name, um, your organization, etc. We should have added background music, Belvin. I know, I never figured out how to do that. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Like elevator music. <laughs> One more minute and then I'll I'll start so that we're on time. Um, so I think I should I should get started now. Huh? So um, hi everybody, um, welcome to our um, ESRC Festival of Social Science event, uh, which is also co-sponsored by uh, the European Association of Work and Organisation Psychology (EVOP) Impact Incubator. Uh, so our event is titled uh, "Making Chocolate Teapots: Striving for Good Youth Work." And during today's event, we will be introducing several policy briefs, um, all focusing on different aspects of striving uh, for good youth work. Uh, today's event is organized by me, uh, Bergen Okai Somerville at University of Glasgow, um, Dora Scolarius at University of Strathclyde, and Rosalind Searle at University of Glasgow. And um, we're all very happy to see you here. Um, Dora, if we can move on to the housekeeping slide, please. That's it. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, um, as I said earlier, feel free to introduce yourself um, in the chat, your, your name, your organization, where you're from. Um, and we would love to hear from you as much as possible during the event. So after each themed presentation, we will pause and um, take questions and answers for five minutes. So please use the Q&A function for your questions and comments to the presenters. And please use uh, the social media to talk about the event as well. We would appreciate that. And the event is being recorded. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. <laughs> so a little bit about the background of how we ended up here um, is since uh, June 2020, we've been involved in several activities associated with youth employment and a lot of the researchers that you will hear from today are actually um, connections that we've started making um, back in June 2020. Um, so our first event was an EVO PSRC uh, small group uh, meeting um, where we had a, a bunch of researchers, employers and policymakers for a duration of the week talking about young people's work, employment and careers. Um, following that, last year, this week, during the ESRC Festival, 
um, we held a digital exhibition on LinkedIn, uh, which was very experimental, and presented illustrations um, that were produced during our small group meeting. Um, and in June 2021 this year, um, together with Angela Carter, who I'm assuming is amongst the audience as well, um, we published a special issue on youth employment in EVOP's practitioner journal, In Practice. Um, and two of the authors you'll hear today are also um, in that special issue. They have uh, two pieces in that special issue as well. Um, so today's event invites court, um, contributors to these um, previous um, events to produce policy briefs, which translate all that scientific evidence to, um, into everyday knowledge that we can be acted upon. And uh, following the event, the briefs that we produced uh, will be available on EVOP Incubator website, which I think Rose has kindly shared in the chat as well. Um, I should also add our title is courtesy of the European Youth Parliament, who used the term making chocolate teapots to describe the lack of purpose and meaning um, in poor quality jobs that young people are employed in. And Andra Tofan, who's with us today as one of the panelists, will tell you more about that um, towards the end of, of the briefs as well. Um, so we have a packed program today and uh, we will start by considering why youth employment is important and uh, what it means to graduate in the, in the pandemic. And our next themed session will be inclusive youth employment, followed by career skills. And um, our final set of contributions would be on recommendations for good youth work. Then we'll take a short break, hopefully. And after the break, we have two fantastic um, discussants, Professor Annaline Fourier uh, from uh, KU Leuven and uh, Dr. Anthony Mann from the OECD to discuss um, our, our briefs for us. So our first speaker today is uh, Professor Rosalind Searle, uh, who will give us an overview of why good youth employment is important. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to talk, Belgin and Dora. So, as uh, Belgin identified, uh, this is part of an ongoing piece of work that we've been doing. Sorry, you can hear a clock ticking, <laughs> chiming in the background. Sorry about that. Um, so this is part of an ongoing piece of work for the EWAP Impact Incubator uh, that I have the privilege of directing. And what we uh, identified, we launched last November and we really felt that we had a responsibility to identify and work on topics that were critical during the pandemic. And sadly, youth employment was one of them. Can I have the slide, please, Dora? So we've already established um, over a number of years that young people and the employment of young people has been in crisis. And we were aware that the start of a pandemic was just going to exacerbate that problem um, far more markedly for them. So as you can see on the slide, it's really from the International Labour Organization highlighting the depth of this problem across our world and just how many young people are not only unemployed, which means that they are unable to fulfill the potential that they have, but also a number are working in poverty. So they are able to find work, but that work is unable to sustain them and to give them a good quality of life. Or they are outside of work in terms that they are not in employment, education and training. So they are literally sitting. And sadly, I think speaking to you today from Scotland, Scotland has one of the biggest drugs problems across Europe, and you cannot help but wonder whether work and lack of work contributes to that markedly. So you can see in terms of particularly from the EWAP impact incubators perspective, we wanted to start to address the United Nations agenda all around sustainable development and here in particular um, their agenda item eight that's all around full productive work for people particularly and I've underlined it for young people and people with disabilities. So as I highlighted, we know from ongoing research, the multiple scarring effects. So young people are unable to save for their futures. They're unable to save for their pensions. They're unable to transition into adulthood. And that has really important consequences for them going forward. Next slide, please. So in work that we're, I've been doing with Belgin and another speaker that you're here today, Eva Selenko, we really highlighted how this impacts in different ways. So in particular, thinking about 
the capability of young people to start their adult lives. It has this wider socioeconomic consequence that means that they are unable to fulfill the potential. And actually, if you think about this in terms of the way that often pensions provisions are set up, they require current workers to support workers that have retired. So young people not being part of their pension plan, uh, yeah, not, young people not being part of work means that they're not part of your pension plan. So this is why it matters to everybody. And as we've highlighted, the recent um, events of COVID-19 have actually increased the problem because so many young people have started and shifted, if they could, into education as a way of sheltering. But then it just means that we're going to have a bigger bubble of younger people coming out who have great qualifications. But how far are those qualifications aligned to work? And that's a real challenge for educators. And a number of the speakers you'll hear today are educators. So I want to hand over to this wonderful initiative um, that Dora Belgin and myself have been privileged to be support part of. This is all part of an ongoing area for the EWOP Impact Incubator that is all around this critical issue of getting young people into meaningful, viable work. Thank you. Thanks, Roz. Um, and I want to start off by zooming in on one particular study that Belgin and I have been involved with, um, along with our colleagues from Gla Glasgow University, Scott Hurrell, and Strathclyde, Daria and Pauline, who are my colleagues at Strathclyde. And what we looked specifically at graduates in our respective institutions. Um, and it, we asked, we focused in specifically on those graduating last year, um, right into the pandemic and um, focused in on the city of Glasgow, where we looked at our two universities and one of the colleges, um, which is more vocational and, and is often an uh, under-researched group. Um, and although we only have the results from the 2020 cohort to report to you today, we're following on by looking at what these graduates are doing one year later. So we're just about to launch our wave two survey here. And we're also looking at a second cohort and the graduates of 2021. Unfortunately, I can't report on any of those findings yet today, um, but we're very hopeful that we can follow these graduates and look at their employability and employment outcomes and well-being outcomes um, uh, over a, a longer period of time. But just to give you a snapshot of our cohort from last year and the survey that we, uh, we gave them, uh, we have about 500 um, of these graduates to examine and we found that about 31% of them uh, found employment in what we might call a graduate job related to their qualifications. Um, unfortunately, that meant quite a lot of them were still unemployed or were underemployed, and a, a large chunk of them went on to further training, postgraduate education. There's a little snapshot of our sample. 45% of them came from STEM subjects, 33% from social science, and 19% from arts and humanities. Um, just to mention that college population, um, which is often not studied amongst graduates, we thought was very important because they may represent a particularly vulnerable group in the COVID context. We also had a look um, at, you know, we, we made sure to look at the traditional things that we might look at in studies of employability. We looked at career competencies that might buffer against any of the COVID career shock that these graduates had um, were, were facing. We looked at both subjective and objective employability. So as well as employment status and, and self-reported salary, we looked at subjective measures like perceived employability and job satisfaction. But we, we also wanted to look at potential inequalities emerging from the COVID impact, particularly on caring responsibilities and any long-term health issues or, or health inequalities that might emerge. Part of the wider study was to look at sustainable careers. Um, so as well as productivity outcomes like employability, we were looking at health and happiness as well um, in the traditional sustainable careers model that, that we were following. But these particular results I'll talk about just now 
are focusing in on employability and career competencies. So what did we find in brief? We, we were looking for potential demographic differences, because remember, this is just a snapshot at that point in time, about, about a year ago. And what we can see is that some degree subjects like STEM and so social science subjects in comparison to arts and humanities were more likely to be in work. If you're in good health, you were more likely to be in work, perhaps not surprising. Um, men and uh, students from particular social backgrounds, those who were not first generation graduates were more likely to be in a job that related to their chosen career. And this parallels what we're calling graduate jobs. So they were less likely to be underemployed. The passage of time made a difference to salary. Um, so the further, the further along in time it was from the actual point of graduation, from when they answered the survey, the more likely they were to have a higher income. Not surprising, full-time contract jobs and not being a college graduate. In other words, the university graduates are in a better position as we might expect. So the demographic uh, characteristics, uh, perhaps not unsurprising, but they demonstrate that arts and social sciences and health inequalities may be emerging in terms of being in work and being in a chosen uh, a job paralleling your chosen career. Looking at the importance of career competencies, which, which is relevant to what we're talking about today and, and potential, uh, potentially what we can do about this, um, the career competencies focusing in on certain types of behaviours like networking, um, we're more likely to uh, be associated with graduates with a higher salary and higher job satisfaction, greater work exploration, they were more likely to be in work rather than unemployed, and both of these career competencies led to higher perceived employability. So the importance of career competencies, health, um, and, and no other kind of impacts in terms of caring responsibilities were emerging is quite important and how the career competencies could be utilised. One minute warning, Dora. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> um, so there's an interplay, what's coming out is an interplay between, um, uh, between these career competencies, potential vulnerabilities. Some, some were good because we had um, sort of qualitative reports from students who felt this gap has given me a chance to reevaluate and reassess my career plan. So if they were able to do that, it, it ended up in some good employment outcomes. But more often we were finding uh, health issues interlacing with financial problems, stunting if you want the ability to use career competencies. And just, you know, finally to sort of set us up for today, um, what can we do? We identified potential mental and, and physical health inequalities and how some graduates, particularly arts and humanities and college graduates, were able to use career competencies. And really, this is just an appeal, I suppose, to our, our discussion here today, that as practitioners, as academics, as, as um, policymakers, we can focus in on facilitating uh, individual resilience through development of career competencies, addressing supply and demand issues, particularly in the creative industries that have been especially affected, um, minimizing long-term scarring, perhaps by um, encouraging employers to expand work-based learning opportunities um, and advocating for more youth mental health services, and fu fundamentally uh, stakeholders cooperating in this common goal. So that's a snapshot of our study across the two universities. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions at this point and pause. Do we have any questions in the chat? We can just move on to the next uh, theme and um, the questions and answers will be there so if if you guys would like to put comments in um oh uh i think i missed something here from holly anderson uh so holly is asking do you think that the structure of courses such as stem subjects 
which often put emphasis on career long reflection has set people up better for understanding their skills going forward. That's a, it's a really good question. And Belgen and I actually did a more focused study recently on contrasting career exploration for STEM versus arts, arts and humanities and social science. And the data that we looked at earlier was pre-pandemic and the STEM subjects actually were definitely more focused, set up for focused career competency, behavioral skills, and ended up in more focused careers. But where they really suffered was in career exploration and subjective uh, career satisfaction once they actually went into their careers. However, I think as you make a really good point, Holly, about setting them up to be prepared for career shocks like the pandemic. And I think what we're seeing in this first wave that we did, although it's just a snapshot not long after graduation, that more focused um, preparation in STEM subjects is more likely to have ended up in a focused job um, employment three months after the career shock, three, four, five months after the career shock. So I don't know, Belgian, if you have any thoughts on that, that maybe our data pre-pandemic is not showing <laughs> not um, showing at the full picture. I think one of the interesting things that came out in the data was um, uh, the arts and humanities are often associated with more networking skills because that's the nature of career development. And what we found in this data set was that even for these key skills that are associated with developing careers in arts and humanities, they were reporting lower competencies and lower behaviours. And that's probably to do with the lack of opportunities for getting together with people and performing work, etc. So the, the courses do provide different types of skills, STEM definitely more focused and uh, arts and humanities require definitely more exploration. And, um, and I think the data shows that when you remove those opportunities for you know, networking and exploring options, then that's, that's the crucial difference to how people experience the transition as well. Um, I think we might have one more question, if, uh, if that's okay, Dora. Yes, of course. We might have time for one more question, then we can come back um, to... Um, yes, to answer Liz's question, college grads did level six degrees too, just in a different type of institution. Yes, level six as in equivalent to a bachelor degree some, and apprenticeship. Um, yes, they did, they did. Um, but it was a, 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 a local college where there was a whole range of different types of degrees, um, but less likely to do a bachelor degree in the college than in the universities. Um, shall we move on to our next theme and then we can come back to the questions and answers um, yeah. just to give everyone opportunities I'll keep to. Clicking the slides then, shall I? Okay. 